Okay, YouTube. So I wanted to uh, record another video to expand on the internet workings for the Zip protocol. I already have a video out there for the registration process on the Zip protocol. So I'm going to try to go over the basics for a call flow without transfer, without invites uh, being used for different coders. Just the the very basic call flow that you can find within the Zip protocol. And then we're going to be evaluating some uh, more complicated setups. So I just set up. Uh, an extension asterisk that's going to answer my call right away as soon as I call it and then I'm going to go ahead and uh, drop the call when it reaches somewhere around now uh, 8 seconds so we can um, expand some of these um, set of matrices. So a couple of things here to note is you will find uh, two basic type of messages you will find uh, requests and you will find status. Uh, requests are origin originated requesting some sort of service like a new call or a transfer or a disconnect for a call towards the SIP server and the status is the reply that comes from the server towards the client regarding that specific transaction. Um, instead we have the concept of a user agent client and a user agent server in this case our uh, endpoint here is playing the role for the client and the asterisk server where everything is hosted is playing the role for the uh, agent server 139 would be the asterisk and 78 that one would be the client couple of things that are very useful uh, when troubleshooting SIP is this VoIP calls menu um, if you click on this option it will try to parse all the different calls that it can find from the current packet capture so you will see the start time and the stop time from the beginning of the recording or whatever you have displayed here you will see the from and to um, for the call you will see the protocol and you will see the state of the call whether it was completed, if it was rejected, uh, if it was dropped somewhere in between then you can go ahead and uh, click on this flow option will will give you a very nice diagram for the overall setup of the call so this will um, let you see the call a little bit more graphically the um, direction for the messages and in call flows that are very complicated this is actually very useful so the first thing that we see here is an invite uh, the invite is the message that the C protocol is defined to initiate a call to request for service um, there's a couple of things that are uh, important to notice the first line is the what is known as the request URI. The request URI will specify the directory number that you're calling at the specific server or domain. So it's very important that the server that receives the message is able to understand this, either via their SIP domain configuration, their IP address, their domain name. But th this is, uh, is very relevant, as well as the directory number that you're requesting. Uh, you can see that Wireshark makes a nice decoding for the request URI and then you actually have this set of uh, headers from the message. The first header that you see is the BIA header. The BIA header is used by the SIP proxies to be able to route the calls so basically it will add itself to the BIA header every kind of SIP server or SIP proxy that routes the call. So in this case we only have one BIA header which is our client uh, with its IP address and port number and the, then we have a branch. This branch parameter is what is used to specify a transaction so you can see that for example these two messages they have the same branch ID meaning that they are part of the same transaction. A transaction is a request that has a response basically and then they are encapsulated within the concept for the, for a dialogue. The dialogue will include the complete call and this dialogue will be comprised of a couple transactions like um, these first three messages would play a transaction and then the next um, the next three will be a transaction the act will be a transaction and then the buy and 200k will be a different transaction. For every uh, request you need to have a status or you need to have a reply. The reply can either be a temporary reply, 
it could be a permanent reply uh, we're gonna see a little bit more about that later uh, then after you have the BIA header you usually have this max forward parameter that will specify the maximum amount of uh, or the amount of zip hops that the packet has gone through so that number will be decreased every time that it goes to a zip server until it goes to a point where the zip server will no longer uh, accept that message because it's, it's going into a loop or it's been going round and round between um, a large amount of zip servers. We have the from of the two. The from usually specifies uh, your caller ID, caller ID name, although we have some specific uh, headers for that that are newer than the from. It's not recommended to use the from to deliver caller ID, but the from will specify the identity of the user that is actually making the request. Uh, the true, you might see it the same as the request you write. Uh, you might see it a little different depending if the request you write gets changed along the way of the call, but usually would we'll specify the resource that you're requesting. Now the contact is very interesting because the contact um, allows the server or specifies to the server who he should be contacting regarding this specific call because this endpoint right here might have multiple accounts running on the same socket on port 5060 so the way you would actually differentiate traffic from one to another would be by the use of the contact so in, you can, in this case you can see the blink generates like a, a random numbers for this usually you will see like a thousand or the same number where the phone is registered but this basically allows the phone to have multiple identities multiple contacts under the actual uh, uh, endpoint or the same endpoint finally the call ID the call ID will uh, mark uh, the call and you will see that the call ID will remain the same for the entire call so this will allow you within a trace file or pack capture or a debug on Asterix let you track down all the different messages that correlate to the same call ID. Now in this particular case you can see that this invite is being challenged by Asterix with an unauthorized. Uh, this is not the default behavior for zip or a lot of zip phones don't don't usually um, work this way but Asterix does you can configure it um, in a different way so that is going to be an insecure invite not be challenged it will be allowed because the phone is basically uh, registered and you can see that besides the uh, headers that we discussed we see a couple new headers coming in we see an allow header that specified all the messages that Asterix understands like an invite, an act, cancel, options by, refer, subscribe, notify and info and you can see as well the sequence number the sequence number is generated um, randomly um, some sequence number starts from one some other stands from a higher number it depends on the implementation for the zip line but you will see the sequence number increasing so you can see that this for example this unauthorized it goes to the sequence 15A31 and byte uh, which is this one right here and then you will see uh, this one um, increasing so that will let you in case that the messages get swapped then you can see that this shrine goes for this particular invite and not for this one because you can see that they have a different sequence number so that will let you track sequential invites or sequential requests for the same call ID. Uh, another header you can see is the server is optional is usually included by the servers or the gateways to specify the uh, the version of software that they're running is usually a security risk so you might want to change that we have some ways to uh, mask that out uh, to prevent that information from being displayed and you see that the client sends an acknowledge down to the unauthorized um, so we're forced to use some information from this request this number used ones is very similar to the register one is a is a randomly generated value that is going to be used to compute the um, response for the challenge with the um, password for the user so you will see on the next invite the in, uh, inclusion of an authorization header that has the username, the realm, the same nonce 
and in this case the response in an uh, MD5 format that use the nonce um, to prevent from replay attacks. You will see a trine coming from the server. This is considered um, temporary reply and zip every time that you get an invite you should send immediately a trying without even processing the message just to confirm to the remote endpoint that you actually received that invite. Remember that uh, SIP is only uh, required to be supported on UDP as, R as per RFC 3261. Uh, TCP is optional so in the case for UDP what you're gonna see if you don't get a trying is the client just retransmitting invites every 200 milliseconds every 500 milliseconds or so. So you want to send out a trying as soon as possible to prevent any retransmissions from this invite. Um, the 200K, it's um, a final reply. Anything within the 200, 300, 400, 500, and 600 series is permanent reply. Um, this one is usually specified for connection of a call. So within the message body, you will see the different um, session description protocol, all the SDP for the audio of the call. So a couple of things that you will find here, the um, session ID for the owner that's not very relevant. What is important is this connection information, the C line will specify the address that you need to send the audio to and then the M line um, will specify the port number, the RTP port number that you need to send these to and the different payload types that are supported. Payload type 0, payload type 8 and payload type 101. Now you will have an RTP map for payload type 0 that specify what codec that means because although this is standard some vendors might mm, have a different mapping so it's kind of required to specify what type of codecs you're actually referring. So you can, in this case you can see is uh, PCMU, also known as G711ULO, PCMA, also known as G711ALO, at 80 kil kilobits per second. Um, you have payload type 101, telephone event, RFC 2833 for DTMF uh, relay, and uh, you can see that um, events from 0 through 16 are supported by the remote side. Uh, then you have a P time of 12 milliseconds for the packetization size and send receive for two way audio. So this call is going to be two way. Now, these are the capabilities that are being offered by the server. Out of these codecs, we need to confirm with one and we need to confirm whether these capabilities like silence or suppression of and the DTMF will be accepted by us. So on the next message, on the acknowledge, uh, you will see sometimes the SDP, sometimes you might see it before it on the invite. Like in this case, you can see that the client is specifying the uh, SDP on the invite. Uh, what this means is this call is early offer. Early offer, we, the client offered the audio capabilities right at the initial invite and then the server basically confirms whether on delay offer you would see the capabilities confirm on the ACK but the actual uh, message contained pretty much doesn't bar right is, is the same so you can see the address for the endpoint the RTP port number payload types 9, 104, 103, 102, 08, 101 you can see all the different codecs this client supports some specs capabilities G722 and uh, G7 uh, G711, ALO and ULO and uh, RFC 2833 as well send receive that looks good so by the time we send the ACK to the server in reply to the 200 the call is connected this ACK is mandatory you cannot have a 200 without an ACK because this 200 will start being retransmitted until the call disconnects so the ACK is mandatory you will find some uh, buggy zip clients that don't send the ACK uh, with replies to 200 that will usually lead to call drops after call being connected for some time. Then uh, you can see a buy message. The buy signals the disconnection for the call. Sometimes you might find a ISDN cost link to the buy. Not in asterisks. You, Cisco usually do that. Um, 
when the server receives the buy, it's time to release the call, and that gets replied with a 200 uh, two sequence for the buy message. So in this particular case, we have one dialog uh, composed with um, let's see how many branches we have. Um, uh, we have one transaction so far. Here we have two transactions and you can see that the ax is a separate transaction and then the buy is a separate transaction so we have one two three four we have four different transactions total for this call ID um, you will see that the codex might change in the middle of the call by sending an other invite while the call is connected that is usually called a re-invite and that is used when you need to transfer the call from one destination down to the other uh, to turn down the media path and then open a new media path against another destination, make a codec change on the flight, or um, things of that sort. There's some other messages like update that changes capabilities, usually color ID and things like that. And you will see some other messages like 302 diversion or a refer, uh, but we will be expanding on those um, at, a, at a later point. So I hope this has been a uh, uh, informative.